1861, the states of Italy formed together for the first time in centuries to become a unified country. The new nation had a long maritime history in the Mediterranean, dating back several millennia to the Romans who had mastered the waves of their empire. The sea had been a bastion of art, science, philosophy, religion, culture, and Western society. This tremendous value had long been something nations and empires were desperate to monopolize. The newly minted state had quickly placed prime importance on this sea control, and so the Regia Marina began to steadily grow. Despite setbacks like the Battle of Lisa in 1866, the Italians were incredibly innovative and drew on their long history of seafaring across the Mediterranean to build up a modern fleet. These efforts were initially unsuccessful, as with the naval budget being significantly reduced, the Regia Marina's construction plans were slowed and fleet efficiency declined dramatically. Finally, in the 1870s, the newly appointed Minister of the Marine, Simon Antonio saint Bon, began to truly make progress. Successfully overseeing the completion of some of the most powerful warships in the world, saint Bon put the Regia Marina on the fast track to success. In 1896, an Italian corvette, the Magenta, successfully circumnavigated the world. The following year, they conducted several tests with Julilmo Marconi, experimenting with new radio technology. Finally, the Italian officer Vittorio Cuneberte was one of the first to publish a design for an all-big gun battleship. His drawing was quickly picked up by Italian high command, who immediately began preparing designs for a future battleship based on his concept. The task now fell to Rear Admiral Engineer Eduardo Masdea, who not only had to produce a ship that was in the spirit of Cuneberte's design, but also one that could meet the needs and capabilities of the Regia Marina. In particular, Masdea had orders to keep the superstructure and funnels to a minimum. His final design would be named for one of Italy's greatest poets, Dante Alighieri. Displacing 19,550 tons normal load, she was slightly heavier than the ship that would become the first all-big gun battleship ever built, HMS Dreadnought. Curiously, the Italians gave the ship two rudders but in a fascinating layout, situating one directly behind the other. Mastea had jumped on the technology the British had used to propel Dreadnought, the steam turbine, showing considerable foresight as most other powers would retain the older triple expansion engine on their first attempts to create their own Dreadnoughts. Another interesting part of the propulsion was the arrangement of some boilers within the ship that exclusively burned oil fuel, the conversion to which would not come for many years in other navies. Dante Alighieri was driven by Parsons steam turbines which turned four shafts generating a design speed of 23 knots, but his service would see a career speed of 22.83 knots. This was still faster than HMS Dreadnought herself, however, by nearly two full knots, an impressive achievement. By far and away the most revolutionary part of Dante Alighieri would be her main armament. She was the first battleship in the world to use triple turrets, something once thought by many to be impossible. These housed a powerful main armament of 12 12-inch guns in four triple turrets, all arranged along the center line. While this design did not make use of super-firing turrets, it was still arguably superior to most contemporaries, as it not only carried more guns in a broadside, but did not make use of wing turrets, a slow-to-die relic of the pre-dreadnought era. These turrets had excellent arcs of fire, which was enabled by a very odd and minimalistic superstructure and funnel layout. Her secondary battery of 24.7-inch guns was also powerful and laid out in both casemated mounts and double turrets along the hull, another forward-thinking choice as secondary weapons would gradually over time creep out of casemates and into turrets on the deck. The tertiary armament of 13 single 3-inch guns along with three submerged 17.7-inch torpedo tubes rounded out the ship's impressive firepower. All of this weaponry and speed came at the expense of armor protection and Dante Alighieri was less thoroughly protected than Dreadnought. She had a 10-inch thick armor belt near the waterline with a 1.5-inch thick deck. The gun turrets possessed 10 inches of armor, and the conning tower was best protected with 12 inches, completing the armor scheme. While they were like the Americans in their quick realization of the way forward, they also shared the U.S. Navy's frustration with the slow shipbuilding process, as Dante Alighieri would not be laid down until 1909, not launched until 1910, and finally completed in 1913 by which point she had been somewhat outclassed by the newer 13.5-inch gun battleships. Despite this, she was still one of the most powerful warships in the Mediterranean. For a ship that was in many ways one of the best designed in the world, Dante Alighieri would have a career much like many other dreadnoughts that was rather anticlimactic. 
She became a test bed for Curtis float planes the year she was completed, continuing the Italian trend of being at the forefront of naval innovation. When Italy finally chose to enter the First World War on the side of the Allies in 1915, Dante Alighieri was serving as the flagship of the 1st Battle Squadron stationed in Taranto, staying with the force until 1916. For the duration of the conflict, the ship was attached to the Southern Adriatic and Ionian Sea forces. Several attempts were made to lure the Austro-Hungarian fleet out of harbor and force it to battle in hopes of avenging Lisa. This was not to be, as the dual monarchy dreadnoughts remained in port until the end of the war. Consequently, Dante Alighieri never got the chance to fire her guns in anger at an enemy target. The post-war world would see Dante Alighieri survive longer than many other early dreadnoughts. Unlike these contemporaries, she was allowed to be retained after the Washington Naval Treaty due to Italy possessing a relatively smaller navy. King Victor Emmanuel III would use her to entertain delegates to the Genoa Conference in 1922, with notable guests including David Lloyd George. She continued to be used for the testing of new naval technologies, being fitted with a flying off platform on her third turret. She would also be given a tripod mast and taller forward funnels to move smoke further away from the bridge. Testing new fire control systems in 1924, she was able to engage targets at 28,000 yards, an impressive feat. Though the new technology was too heavy for her tripod mast, it would be worked into other Italian battleships due to its success. She would even live to see Mussolini's rise to power, who used her on one trip to Sicily as a means of transport. However, by the late 1920s, Italy's economy had been weakened by costs accumulated during World War I. As a result, the naval budget was one of the items that had to be cut, and as part of this downsizing, Dante Alighieri was sold for scrap, bringing an end to one of the most revolutionary dreadnoughts ever built. Even though she had never fought a battle, she had paved the way for the growth and development of the Regia Marina into a powerful fighting force that had yet to truly have a chance to make its mark upon history. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.